Hey guys, long time no see. Uh, I am back slowly, slowly getting back into everything. Um, I'm really excited that we're going live. I miss my lives, so um, I'm just gonna wait for everyone to join. It usually takes like meh, five minutes or so to start seeing <clears throat> everyone in. And you guys can always start throwing questions at me if you want, I just like to give people a little time to join. But yeah, I'm really excited for our live today. It's been two weeks, so um, I was in Hawaii, I was in Maui, which was so nice. It was so nice to get away. I definitely needed it, like, oh my gosh. So crazy because I didn't even realize how much I needed it until I um, got there and was just laying on the beach and did nothing for a week. Well, I did, we did go with, or I did go with my assistant, Rebecca, so we did get some work done, we did get some planning done, but it was really nice to, like, be away from my environment and kind of just be in a completely different place, and you guys know, like, island time is a real thing, everyone's super relaxed, and it's just very different than Southern California, so it was really nice to relax. I feel nice and, like, refreshed, like, Hawaii dress is very different than pre-Hawaii dress, <laughs> um, so... Let's see what questions we have coming in. Um, thank you guys so much for being super supportive while I was away. You guys like gave me time and gave me space, which was super great. Um, I always appreciate that. Um, hey, your trip sounds amazing. What do you suggest? Um, well, my aunt lives there, so I stayed with my aunt, which was really awesome. So uh, she, she lives in Wailuku, which is kind of like more middle of the island, kind of centrally located. So like in the middle of Kihei and Lahaina and Kanapali. And so um, I truly like like the Lahaina and Kanapali area, but then I also like the Kihei area. So it was really nice to be able to go to both. Um, we did go, we did a few things. So I did do whale watching because it was the best season for humpback whales coming out. So lots of moms with lots of babies which was really cool to see um all but you could totally see that from the shore too like you can see the humpback whales just while you're driving along the coast so that was great um I'm also trying to think oh yeah we did go to the blowholes which was kind of like on the western northern side of the island and we went all around that hump so kind of did that full drive there is kind of like a one lane road but super pretty there's lots of stops around there like waterfalls secret secret little hikes and things like that so that was really fun very scenic very beautiful um I did we did like Kihei twice and then Lahaina twice our Kanapali area we kind of like discovered some secret beaches um we did like Pahoku Park which has a lot of sea turtles lots of tortoises all day long which were or tortoises turtles all day long um super fun to watch them feed and kind of like beach themselves um but yeah kind of like didn't do a whole lot of like sightseeing type things like I'm not really I've been there multiple times so I don't really need to like do the touristy thing um I did more of just like kind of relax chill um my aunt and uncle are local so they kind of know like the the places to go there was this really cool beach called Malawaka beach it's kind of hidden and it was so amazing for snorkeling so that was really fun but yeah overall pretty like chill week didn't really want a whole lot to do it was kind of like take it day by day which was really fun all right, so Holistic Mother says, Hi Jess, I'm in FN and mind blown. Thanks for all you do. Any tips while nursing as far as temps and pulses is concerned? Um, I think it's important to acknowledge, like I wouldn't stress about temps and pulses. I always preface temps and pulses with just don't stress about them. They're kind of a just a, a way to gather extra data and kind of see how things are affecting your body. With that being said, you know, I think temperatures and pulses should be similar while you're breastfeeding and while you're pregnant. Um, I don't think that we should see our temps and pulses lower or our metabolism suppressed when we're pregnant. That shows us that we probably need more fuel. That shows us we probably we have an increased need for calories or energy and this is going to be the same for breastfeeding it's pretty common during breastfeeding to need more energy to keep milk supply up so I would kind of treat them very similarly you might find that when you stop breastfeeding you get a different pulse temp and pulse the only way to know is to get to that point where you're ready to stop and then see if anything changes but um, usually breastfeeding is going to be pretty similar to um, uh, to what would be if you weren't breastfeeding. You do kind of want to keep in mind that your fuel levels or your fuel needs do increase. So you might see metabolism suppressed if you're running off of stress hormones. It is imperative for you to have enough fuel. And if not, your body will definitely sacrifice your tissues in order to 
create fuel for baby. So that's just something to keep in mind. I wouldn't, um, if temps and pulses are low, they probably have been low for, for quite some time, but that's going to be different for every woman. Um, so it's always in context. Let's say they're just slightly low. Maybe that's just normal for you during breastfeeding. And then they're going to change the minute you stop breastfeeding, but there's no really way to know until you kind of go from breastfeeding to not breastfeeding. But usually when it comes to temps and pulses, um, there shouldn't be too much of a shift. You might run hotter, especially when you, if you you have um, high progesterone levels, but keep in mind when you aren't breastfeeding, if you're not ovulating, you're not making progesterone. And so you might find your temperatures are a little lower and there's not much you can do about that except for just support your metabolism, support your body, um, and not really stress about it because, you know, seasons, seasons of life and it's just temporary. Hey Jess, miss you so much. Miss you too, Amber. How are you? I know you've been going through some hard, tough stuff. Uh, miss this community. Been going through a separation since January, so I've been away from everything. Hope all is well. I hope all is well with you too, Amber. And reach out if you need anything, um, if you need any encouragement. Um, you know, this community is definitely here. What suggestions do you have for someone with lots of interrupted sleep, like with a young baby, to help support metabolism, adrenals, etc.? I think the best thing is just to do the, the best with what you have. I think a lot of times women, we, we get really stressed out and like overwhelmed, like, oh my gosh, my sleep habits are awful. And I'm like, well, stressing about your sleep habits just makes things worse. So don't stress about it. Like kind of have the attitude, it is what it is. How can I maybe optimize some things? Well, a lot of us, if you're breastfeeding or you have young children, a lot of times you find yourself rocking your kid to sleep and scrolling through your phone. Probably not the best idea. Turn on an audiobook, turn on a podcast, and listen. Don't be scrolling because um, that light and that kind of it's called the dopamine loop is going to really start to like excite you, and then you're going to not sleep or not sleep as deeply. So, biggest thing is don't scroll through your phone, don't like do things that you would do during the day. Second thing is switch out your light bulbs. If you're turning on all your LED lights, not only is that messing with your circadian rhythm, it's also messing with your child's circadian rhythm and they're not gonna sleep very well. Um, and this goes for before bed as well. It's gonna help the whole family. So make sure you're using like incandescent light bulbs or Himalayan salt lamp pre-bed, especially when you're waking up during the night. A lot of times we'll like flip all the lights on and I'm like, why? in no history or not like I can't think of one time in history where we were exposed to super bright lights in the middle of the night unless we were in like some type of stressful situation so don't you know don't freak your body out like that um and then you know just basics like if you find yourself really having a hard time getting back to sleep you might need some type of snack whether it's a midnight snack or a bedtime snack you might need to you know do something to balance your blood sugar to get yourself back to bed but overall, I wouldn't stress about it. I think it's just kind of like do the best with what you can, but figure out the light situation, figure out the screen situation, and um, do things that are gonna make it easier for you to fall back asleep if you do have to wake up throughout the night. Off the pill for five months, ovulating in period every month, but ovulating seven days into cycle causes have been, don't see the rest of it. So, um, uh, you know, when it comes to birth control, it's so exciting to be ovulating again and to be kind of like, yay, I'm getting that ovulation, I'm getting that progesterone. Um, ovulating seven days into the cycle is not optimal, but as long as your cycles are lasting, usually I think the um, Institute of Gynecology says uh, a, a normal cycle is going to last anywhere from 21 to 35 days. And so often if your cycle is falling in that 21 to 35 day zone, it is considered, I believe, normal. So it's one of those things where you kind of have to say, okay, it, do I have a normal cycle? Now it's time to kind of work on optimizing the cycle, possibly. But I wouldn't stress about it. It's now like about just doing what you're doing. If you've gotten your ovulation back, you've gotten your period back, you've gotten your cycle back, you're moving in the right direction and you want to just keep moving in that direction. Lack of tolerance to dairy is an expression of something deeper. How do we know what this deeper problem might be? Often it's small intestinal bacteria overgrowth or small intestinal irritation, which usually happens from a slow metabolism. So if you have really low temps and pulses and you are, and food's gonna move through your digestive tract really slowly, there's gonna be a lot of bacteria just eating that up. And if it's spending more time in the digestive tract, it's going to, you know, you're gonna have lots more fermentation occur. So that's something to keep in mind, slow metabolism. 
or small intestinal bacteria overgrowth, which usually go together. Um, low T3 can definitely be a, a driving factor. We need the hormone T3 and the hormone progesterone in order to make an enzyme called lactase, which breaks down a sugar called lactose. And so if we don't have enough progesterone or we don't have enough T3, oftentimes we'll find digestion of dairy is a little bit harder. Another thing that a lot of people don't think about and they tend to love to blame dairy for is that they're eating tons of irritating foods constantly and then they eat dairy and their body reacts to dairy. And it's because their body's already irritated. Imagine like a scratch, like you scratch your arm, like you're just scratching up your arm. It's really raw all the time. You're just rubbing kale and chia seeds and hemp seeds all over that scratch and you just keep scratching it. And then all of a sudden you, you dump some dairy on it. Now I'm sure it probably wouldn't want to irritate your skin, but there are some things in there that do require um, optimal digestion in order to break it down. And so you're here irritating your, your gentle or your very, very delicate mucosal, thin skinned intestine with like all this rough irritating foods. And then you eat dairy and it bothers you and you're like, oh my God, it's the dairy. And I'm like, maybe it's all the other foods that are wreaking havoc on your digestive tract. So don't overlook the concept that it could be other things in your diet and you're reacting to dairy because those things are irritating you. Yeah, dairy is expressing the issue, but your intestines are already freaking irritated. So kind of keep that in mind. If you're eating tons of raw greens, if you're eating tons of nuts and seeds, if you're um, eating tons and tons of cruciferous vegetables, um, that's going to be irritating. Most likely tons of beans, tons of grains, like all those things take a lot of digestive capacity. And if you're not optimal, you're gonna, that's gonna wreak some havoc on your, on your digestive tract. And then dairy can, can kind of express that issue. How do you feel about a high carb, low fat diet for weight loss, trying to get my life back on track? I wouldn't stress about the diet, but anytime you wanna lose fat, high carb, low fat is the way to go. You always want to keep protein consistent around 100 to, you know, 130 grams, sometimes a little more depending on your weight, depending on your goals, especially if you're weight training a lot, there's some women that just won't give it up. And so I'm like, well, then you got to increase your, your protein intake slightly. But overall, I think like a, a protein diet, like a sufficient amount of protein, I hate to say high protein, because it's not really about high protein. It's like you need sufficient amounts of protein. So you're not breaking down muscle tissue. And then you need to make sure you're getting lots and lots of energy. And so carbohydrates are going to be the best source of energy. Fats are the, the worst source of energy, honestly, because there's nine calories per gram. They don't really require a lot of energy to burn them. And so they tend to slow down the metabolism. Now, this is not to say fats are bad. Fats have their role. Fats are needed to protect the cell membrane. Um, they're needed to make steroid hormones. But I always am very picky and choosy with my fats. And if I have a little extra flab to lose, fats are gonna be the first thing to go because I know that they're really energy dense and they don't really provide me with a lot of energy. For example, just to kind of give you an example, cause I know a lot of people are like, you need to eat fat to burn fat. And I'm like, well, if you have a lot of fat on your body, you have a lot of fat to burn. So like, we let's, let's stop that. You know, we went from like this really like crazy low fat society to now this like crazy, like let's eat all this fat society. I'm like, there's a moderate fine line. like. Uh, would you prefer to eat two bananas before a workout or two tablespoons of butter? They're both the same amount of calories. Actually, the, the butter is going to be probably like about 10 more calories, but do they provide the same amount of energy? I just want you to answer that question from your common sense point of view without even science playing a role. You know, would you prefer to have a workout on two bananas or two tablespoons of butter and kind of make that, that decision? Um, so I, I think moderate fat or even a lower fat um, style of eating is best for weight loss and for insulin resistance as well. Keeping it pretty low fat is is the way to go because when you're insulin resistant or you're having a hard time burning fat, your are your cells are already using fat. Um, they they your your body's not using glucose efficiently. You're using fat instead, and you want to kind of get it across to your body like, hey, we gotta burn carbs. We gotta burn glucose. We can't burn fat anymore unless we absolutely need to. It shouldn't be your default. And so that's what um, eating less fat looks like. But usually it doesn't need to be less than like 15 to 20% of the diet. And that's going to look low for someone that has like a keto pass or a low carb pass. A lot of times people come to me and they're eating their high fat diet, you know, that they're used to. They're used to this 
high fat keto style of eating. They just pound the fat on everything. And then they're also adding in carbohydrates. And I'm like, you can't do both. You know, your body prefers glucose. It needs a little fat to function to make hormones, but it's not like going to run off of fat. It's not its preferred source of fuel. Do you suggest still eat every three to four hours, even if not hungry, to keep blood sugar balanced? Um, well, this is going to be a very, uh, this is a context-based question because oftentimes women uh, are not in tune with their hunger signals anymore. They've suppressed their hunger signals over time and they've lost their appetite uh, due to stress hormones. So if temps and pulses are good, meaning that you're not running off of adrenaline, you're not running off of cortisol, you're not running off of stress, then you might be actually keeping your blood sugar balanced for four to five hours. Great. Awesome. You don't have to eat every three to four hours. Oftentimes women have lost their appetite. They don't realize it, but they're actually not hungry because they're running off of stress. They're eating their own muscle tissue. They're eating their own thymus tissue. They're eating their own tissues to literally function. And they're like, oh, I'm not hungry. Like I can go six hours without eating. And I'm like, yeah, because now you're eating yourself alive. And that's why you have low progesterone. That's why you're losing your hair. That's why you, you know, you have that cortisol belly, that little flat tire. And so it's very important to understand. Yes, it's important to tune into your body and your hunger signals but if there are hormone imbalances going on and there's a lot of stress and adrenaline there could be a possibly a possible suppression of appetite and a suppression of hunger and if that's what's happening then I do recommend keeping blood sugar balanced manually so it really again it's always about context do you have a test you recommend for testing your progesterone at home um I usually just use um the Dutch test with my clients. That's pretty much my, what am, my go-to test. It's going to test for all sex hormones, all your metabolites, um, stress hormones as well. But if you need to do something where you can like order it at home on your own, um, I have seen this test called Prove around, P-R-O-O-V. And I think it's a urine-based progesterone test, kind of like LH strips. So um, I haven't tried that personally, but um, I've, I've kind of seen it around. So I kind of wonder about that. But no, I usually use the Dutch test with my clients. I'm confused about food macro ratios. I've seen like 100 grams of carbs and then also like 100 grams of protein. Would that mean like 40, 40, 20? I'm trying to eat and heal my body, but weight loss is definitely a goal. Um, usually it's going to be like 50, 25, 25 uh, around that. Sometimes if people aren't losing weight, then they can like move the fats down a little bit and move the carbs up. But it's also important to keep context in mind. I always say the word context because, you know, if you're coming, let's say you're coming from a super low carb keto background and you're eating like 20 grams of carbs a day, uh, it's probably not a great idea to jump to 250 grams of carbohydrates if you haven't been eating carbohydrates for literally years and years and years. So yes, I, I think that like a mac, like an optimal goal is usually around like sometimes like 50, 25, 25. That's usually the sweet spot, give or take a few things. But if you are coming from a, you know, 10% of your calories are coming from carbohydrates and you have a super massive amount of fat in your diet, then you've got to slowly lower fat and you've got to slowly raise carbs over time. And that can sometimes take, you know, four to eight weeks uh, unless you're willing to just gain some weight and then lose it. Um, but yeah, there can definitely be this transition period where you kind of got to like slowly move things. Um, and keep the calories the same. You know, I think macronutrient changes should be done first, and then you should start to bump calories up. Um, it, it's not a good idea to bump calories up first and just get a bunch of calories from whatever, and then change your macronutrients. I would prefer to get macronutrient ratios optimized and then move calories slowly up if you need to. I did an HTMA and results were fast oxidizer, but slowing, hidden copper, super low magnesium, phosphorus, molybdenum, would Morley Robbins protocol still be the same for fast oxidizer? Um, I'm not really sure. I'm not like, I'm not like super familiar with Morley Robbins protocol. Um, I do like a certain parts of it, like his adrenal cocktail, whole foods, vitamin C. I'm getting vitamin A from, um, animal sources like grass fed beef liver. Um, but I don't necessarily do the same things that he does, so I'm not really sure. Um, but yeah, I mean, optimally, we gotta get our 
whole foods vitamin C levels up. We've got to get our sodium and potassium levels optimized. We've got to get our magnesium levels optimized, um, especially for hidden copper. Um, we don't want to take strict molybdenum most of the time. Like that's usually not a great idea. We want to get our phosphorus levels up. A lot of times phosphorus is low though because we are not digesting um, our food well. So digestion isn't optimal. And so our hydrochloric acid is low, which is that stomach acid. And that's what's responsible for breaking down protein. So a lot of times we're not actually absorbing um, uh, phosphorus from from our meats because that's oft, like often where we're going to get them from. But yeah, something similar to that is, is usually um, going to be helpful, but I, I don't really know what your case is. I don't know what your test is. So I don't want to say like, oh yeah, it's great. Or, oh no. Like, um, but usually it's, it's pretty on point. Is Thorns the only K2 you suggest? The oil is so expensive. Um, there is another brand called Innovix, Innovix, I-N-N-O-V-I-X, um, that has a good blend of like MK4 and MK7. It isn't as high as the Thorns like oil. Um, I think like the oil goes the longest way. I know it's really expensive up front, but it tends to last the longest. But Innovix um, is, I think you have to take two for the same uh, dosage that the oil would be. Don't quote me on that, but I believe. Um, and then, yeah, like Jero's K2 can also be good. It just is a lot lower. I think like one's 90 micrograms and one's like 180 micrograms. So, it you know, sometimes we have to take a little bit more to get what we want. Any updates to FN coming? You mentioned some things like two eggs. Do you think more would be okay to up our protein? Yeah, so there's going to be lots of changes coming to Fully Nourished. I'm actually going to make an announcement in the, the group tomorrow. And I'm not going to give you guys like a time frame, like, oh, it's going to be done in a month, but... Um, it's definitely coming. I'm going to completely just like throw all the curriculum out and bring all new curriculum in. It's going to be a similar concept. So it's not going to be like, oh my gosh, it's completely different. Ah, but it's going to more just be like, everything's going to be broken down. It's going to be more, not rules, but like better guidelines, better do this, don't do this, um, more of a protocol based and also, I'm going to probably offer different kind of steps for different individuals. So, for example, if someone's coming from like a very insulin resistant, low carb, keto background, they're going to need to take some different steps than somebody who is like super high metabolism, their adrenals are, are trash. They, you know, th that type of person is going to need way more carbohydrates at first than the person that maybe can't handle those carbohydrates. So there's going to be lots of, of um, fully nourished changes coming. And also if you're in the fully nourished Facebook group, keep an eye out for, I'm going to actually make a post and, ha and ask you guys to give some constructive criticism. Like what would you guys like to see in the curriculum? And I'm going to do my best to take your ideas and, and implement them in a way that would help the community as a whole. So um, I definitely am going to be looking for your feedback to, to make Fully Nourished better. And anyone that's already in Fully Nourished will be grandfathered in. Um, and then like once Fully Nourished is done and revamped, um, there will be definitely be an announcement. Would potassium still be suggested if losing but thyroid ratio is high, adrenal low? And do you ever suggest phosphorus along with balancing magnesium, calcium, potassium? Um... Potassium still be suggested if losing. Yeah, I mean, it just depends on what's going on with everything else. Like, I'd have to really look and see what what um, what could be driving the issue. I do like to see the HTMA in conjunction with a Dutch test, honestly, because it just gives me that much more information. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it just kind of depends. I, I know they say, like, no potassium for fast oxidizers, but if they're losing it, then sometimes it is. Um, I don't... Uh, again, like when it comes to a fast oxidizer, sometimes phosphorus is indicated if, if it's really being lost um, or it's just really, really low, but it just kind of, again, depends. Um, I don't know enough about you to state on that specifically. What if we can only find grass-fed homogenized milk where we are? Is milk still worth pursuing? I think it's more important to just not get obsessed with rules and to more just experiment it and try it for yourself. If you do find on homogenized milk, you don't get any symptoms, you are great with it. It's a great source of vitamin A. It's a great source of fat-soluble vitamins, you know? It's a great source of protein, uh, especially if it's a little bit lower in fat. But um, if you don't do well on it, then don't pursue it. Um, I think it's kind of one of those things where it's just all relative. It's not like, oh God, I need to implement dairy, but I can't find it anywhere. Stress. 
or, oh my gosh, uh, you know, like, I don't know if I, I, I tolerate this or not, you know, do you, does it work well? Do you feel really good doing it? If not, then don't do it. So it, it doesn't need to be like rocket science. It's just kind of like, if you do well on it, great. If you don't, don't eat it and, and get your protein from somewhere else. How do you feel about potassium pills? Um, it, it really depends on the person. I've had people that are so low in potassium, they definitely need to supplement potassium. Um, but you have to kind of know um, if, you, if you're not low in potassium and you supplement potassium pills, you can cause a really big mineral imbalance. So you definitely don't want to go overboard either. I prefer something that's going to be whole foods or like in conjunction with sodium, like the Adrenal Cocktail by Jigsaw. But some people do need potassium pills, honestly. So... Again, it just kind of depends. Is there anything else that will lower histamine aside from DOA, coenzyme A pathway? Sorry, I got to drink some water for a sec. Um, you know, when it comes to histamine, oftentimes it's a copper issue. So you have copper dysregulation. It's not necessarily copper toxicity, but you have low bioavailable copper and high unbioavailable copper. This usually happens like with birth control use or IUD use, like copper IUD use. Um, sometimes like from drinking too much water from copper pipes. So um, it can have different causes. But when it comes to histamine metabolism, it's really, um, DOA might lower histamine, but um, um, I think, no, it's not DOA, it's DAO. Um, the DAO enzyme might lower a uh, histamine, but it's not fixing the problem. Whereas usually the problem is a B6 deficiency, vitamin B6, uh, magnesium deficiency, and then bioavailable copper deficiency. And then oftentimes it's also, your, your body's under so much stress, it's burning through um, vitamin C faster than you can implement it. And so oftentimes people that are on their health and wellness journey are oftentimes limiting their fruit intake, they're not drinking fruit juices. And so they're making their problems worse because you, where's your potassium coming from in your diet? You you know, you could only eat so many gosh darn potatoes, you know, and so um, that's another thing to kind of consider. A lot of people are not consuming enough potassium or vitamin C in their diet, and that's causing more problems, which is why I'm such a fan of orange juice. And everyone's always like, are you sure for PCOS? And I'm like, yes, like we need the vitamin C. We need those anti-inflammatory compounds that are in orange juice. We need the potassium. And if we're not getting it, you know, our body's having to do without it, which is usually compensating and shifting hormones because of that. So um, usually when it comes to histamine, it's a vitamin C issue, vitamin B6 issue, mag mostly a magnesium issue, and then a copper issue. How does red light therapy work? If we made your DIY device, how far away should it be? And what is the minimum max time per day to see results? Um, it, it, so our bodies actually need red light in order to convert um, cholesterol into hormones. So we need vitamin A and we need red light specifically. And so a lot of times we're, when we, we have to remember that sunlight is red light. Sunlight, I know it doesn't look red, but it is red light. And so I think a lot of people get confused about red light. Like they think, oh, well, red light's like this different thing. And I'm like, well, sunlight is red light. And so when we are not getting, a lot of people think the only benefit from sunlight is vitamin D. And so they're like, I'm just going to supplement vitamin D and like, I'll be great. And I'm like, no, it's not just about the vitamin D. It's also about actual needing red light in order to convert cholesterol into progesterone, cholesterol into DHEA, cholesterol into all of your steroid hormones. And so when we lack red light, and a lot of times we have a vitamin A deficiency or, or um, one or the other, we can't really convert cholesterol into our steroid hormones very well. So it's just something to consider. We need red light in order to have longevity. It's very healing. It's just very restorative to the cells. Um, and then, you know, there's many ways to get exposure to red light. You can do chicken light. You can do reptile lights. Um, you can just do like a bright incandescent bulb in a clamp light. You know, it, it doesn't take much. Incandescent lights are in a sense red light. Even if they don't have a red spectrum to them, they are red light. And so... It's very easy to get red light. You don't have to make the device I made. I probably would make it a little different now. Um, I probably would just do like an incandescent light with a with a clamp light, which I'm probably going to do as well, and I'll make sure I make a story about that. But yeah, a warming red lamp, chicken lamp, a reptile lamp, whatever it is, just like those 
those animals need sunlight in order to function, so do we. And we need the red light. We need that, that spectrum of light in order to make hormones. Hi Jess, what would you recommend for someone who eats healthy but scored 102 on sugar level test and has occasional nerve pain in arms? What would break insulin resistance and reverse prediabetes? Do you have prediabetes? Because if you have a fasting blood sugar level, eight to 10 hours after you ate your last meal, your body's making its own sugar and it's, that's what's keeping blood sugar high. Um, it's not sugar from the last meal. <laughs> um, I, I don't know if that was fasting, um, but if it was fasting, then what? I, I don't understand why people think they have prediabetes. If their last meal was 10 hours ago, <laughs> they uh, are actually, their blood sugar already dropped and then their adrenaline and cortisol levels flipped on and they're actually eating their own muscle tissue and making sugar out of out of their own protein out of their own muscle tissue it's being sent to the liver through a process called gluconeogenesis and gluconeogenesis is raising your blood sugar levels so by the time you test your blood sugar in the morning you're so effing stressed out that you're eating yourself so Oftentimes, simply eating a, a snack before bed that contains some carb and some protein fixes that issue within a week. I literally thought I was pre-diabetic for five years and it was getting worse and worse and worse as I went lower and lower carb and then keto. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm waking up with like 130, 140, what the heck's going on? And the minute I started eating carbohydrates again, about two weeks later, my fasting glucose was 82. And so I was like, oh my gosh, like, huh, wonder why that happened. Now I know that everyone that's like proclaiming low carb and keto for people that have prediabetes is just, oof, oof. They do not understand the process of, of gluconeogenesis and high cortisol. So oftentimes it's a, it's a pointing to a blood sugar imbalance, but again, I don't know your situation. So I'm just, this is just speculation. It's not medical advice. Um, I, I recommend going by what your doctor says, but keep in mind that we have certain processes that will keep blood sugar levels high or steady when we're under stress. My knee has been swollen for far too long. I don't want to take ibuprofen. Do you think I should or can aspirin work for it? I'm not a doctor, you guys, so like questions like that, that's definitely for your doctor. Um, I, I don't know what you should do for your swollen knee, but I think that you should definitely get it checked out if it, if it hasn't been checked out. Um, how do you feel about supplementing selenium? Um, it can be helpful, I think, for some. Um, it, it's again like one of those things where when we start to implement specific minerals when we don't need them, they, it can be a problem. But if we do need them, then it can be really, really helpful and life changing. That's why like you'll find, you know, a million people on the internet that say like, oh, my selenium, I supplemented selenium and I was like, so amazing. And then you try it and you're like, nothing happened for me. Or maybe you'll be like, oh my gosh, it worked amazing for me. So it just kind of depends on what your body's needs are. I apologize for sending question while you were on vacation last week. Didn't realize. Hope you had a chance to relax. Oh, no problem. Um, you guys don't need to like keep up with my sketch. Um, I'm realizing that chronic bleeding spotting may be histamine linked. Genetics and cheese, probiotics, spinach makes it worse. I will, will progesterone oil still benefit if histamine is an issue? And does progesterone help hold on to magnesium and adjust copper bioavailability? Um, you know, so... Okay, how do I put this in a way that's not going to just fly over? Um, when it comes to um, keeping magnesium within the cell, it requires free T3. It requires, um, it requires thyroid hormone. And progesterone is prothyroid. And so in theory, progesterone could possibly help with keeping magnesium in somebody's cell. Um, so that's kind of something that could possibly be, be the case. When it comes to copper bioavailability, um, trying to think of that could have a correlation. Well, estrogen dominance and copper tend to kind of go hand in hand. When we have lots of uh, copper, we tend to store lots of, bind lots of estrogen in our tissues. And so when copper starts to move, so does estrogen. And that can kind of suppress thyroid function. It can suppress progesterone. So, you know, I guess in theory, progesterone could possibly help with um, copper issues as well. Um, um, and then I've definitely seen people that have like, a, um, when their guts are really inflamed or they have really bad issues, um, they can uh, see like a link um, in, in, uh, in bleeding or spotting and uh, histamine intake. And 
we just kind of have to keep in mind that that's usually the sign of a really unhealthy immune system, a really unhealthy gut, and as things improve, it could possibly improve as well. Um, I really like a supplement, um, a probiotic called Just Thrive Probiotic. I think it's a really amazing probiotic. They also have a great supplement called Immunoglobulins, which tends to work pretty well for a lot of people who have like histamine issues and stuff like that. Um, that's kind of what I've seen, but yeah, I, um, you know, keep, keep kind of digging and keep kind of making those correlations. It sounds like you've done a lot of observing of your own body. Is it safe to take Shilajit daily? And do you recommend taking with or without food? I've read the timing can have different effects. Personally, um, I just go by what, what the companies usually say. Oftentimes they'll kind of say like, you can stagger it after taking it daily for a little while. It's kind of one of those things where I think it's, it's a personal thing when it comes to supplements. It's always like, I feel really great on this. I like to take this, I'm gonna take this. Or some people are like, eh, I don't really like it very much. Just kind of depends. Um, when it comes to taking it with or without food, I personally have seen it be, um, good on an empty stomach. It tends to work a lot better than like with a meal. I'm so happy you're back. Your favorite brand of magnesium supplement? I was doing standard process, but I don't think I like it. It just really depends. So I like magnesium bicarbonate. We do need magnesium bicarbonate somewhere in our diet. We can easily make it or um, purchase it. Um, I do like magnesium chloride, which is usually going to be a magnesium oil put on the skin. And then I also like a, a good blend. Um, like Wake Up Maggie by Co Organic is a really good blend. Um, there's, but there's a lot, like Anovix has a good magnesium glycinate, Pure Encapsulations has a good magnesium glycinate. So, you know, I don't really like, there's not like a specific brand that I'm like, yes, it's really dependent on our needs. And some people find that they try something and they're like, oh, this worked excellent for me. And then some people are like, that didn't work at all for me, but I totally noticed an effect with this. So I think it just kind of depends on the person. When having both gut and thyroid problems, I think you recommend focusing first on the thyroid. Does that mean blood sugar regulation or something else? Um, yeah, mostly just blood sugar regulation because the liver needs a constant supply of glucose in order to convert T4 to T3. That usually will speed up the metabolism, which therefore speeds up transit time through the gut, helps with digestive enzyme production, hydrochloric acid production. Our gut health will not improve unless we get stressed down. And improving thyroid function gets stressed down because when our thyroid function is low, our stress hormones have to compensate. And so we tend to have high adrenaline, high cortisol, crazy stress hormones up and down. And so um, supporting the thyroid and focusing on lowering stress are one in the same, and that will therefore help with digestion. Um, a lot of times it you know, resolves maybe 50% of digestive issues and, and keep get things moving and then a lot of times we can do some residual work um, if, if that helps. What is your option on sunscreen for face to keep from aging? Sarah with Healthy Skin Glow says wear it always but what is your take? Um, personally it's very difficult for me to find a sunscreen that does not have polyunsaturated fats in it. And I do not understand why we would put something on our face that's supposed to, supposed to protect us from the sun that literally interacts poorly with the sun. So um, I have not like gotten to that point where I'm like, oh, like I'm gonna wear sunscreen always. I haven't really figured out what to do. Um, like when I was in Hawaii, I wore a sunscreen called Waxhead that you can buy on Amazon. It's like a sunscreen stick. It literally just has beeswax, coconut oil, and zinc oxide in it, which it works great, but it's very, very white and like blue looking. You know, it's a very much like a zinc based sunscreen would look like, but I liked it because it didn't have any poofas in it. Um, so I have not truly been able to find a sunscreen that does not have polyunsaturated fats. I'm going to have to um, reach out to a girl that I follow. She's all about like no poofa skincare. Her, her handle's name is Cosma Beauty, K-O-S-S-M-A. And I should really ask her about how she feels about sunscreen. Um, because I do feel like you're going to really interact with the sun based on what your internal environment is. If your tissues are full of polyunsaturated fats, you eat a ton of plant fats, you um, have tons and tons of stress that's constantly pulling polyunsaturated fats from your tissue, 
then it probably is a good idea to wear sunscreen and, and protect yourself from that that sun because you're gonna those fats are gonna interact very poorly with the sun and oxidize. But if you are really good about eating saturated fats, keeping your stress levels low, your hormones are awesome, your estrogen is balanced with progesterone, then it's probably you're probably a little safer in regards to um, interactions with the sun. So I'm not someone that like wears sunscreen every day. Honestly, I don't like stuff on my face. I prefer nothing. Um, but I might change my mind on that if I could find something that doesn't interact poorly with the sun and doesn't have bad fats in it. What is your option on, oh, sorry, I already read that one. How do you unplug and find inner peace? I don't use my phone often now, but my mind still can't unplug. Um, personally, if, if my mind can't unplug or like I'm having a hard time with pe like peace, I think I've mentioned this before, but like I'll usually go, if I can't like afford like a weekend trip or I'm not really like in a place where I can like go on vacation, um, often I'll do like a day trip. I'll drop everything and I'll just go somewhere. I live close to the beach and so that's where I'm going to go and I just like kind of I'm spontaneous about it. Like I take myself out to breakfast. I might go walk on the beach for a little bit. And even if I can't like find inner peace, I um, usually changing my environment does help. Um, oftentimes I will pray. Um, I don't find that meditation helps. I find that meditation makes it worse. Um, so like I'm going to pray. Um, and then I also, um, sometimes journaling makes it worse as well. It's like, I don't want to really like ruminate with my thoughts, but listening to music, like putting on a playlist that reminds you of happy times, reminds you of maybe a better time of life. You know, I feel like music can kind of be like a time machine. It can bring us back to different places in our life. You know, we usually have a soundtrack to certain times because we're just listening to the same songs over and over certain times in our life. And so I find that like when I listen to playlists from like the nineties or the early two thousands, that was when I was like a teenager and I, you know, I was a lot happier and carefree then. And it really brings me back to like how I felt as, as that young girl. Um, so that's something that really helps me. And then art. Art is always so amazing. Um, whether if you're like not an artist and you're too afraid to like, you know, get a, a blank canvas and paint. Um, I personally love like the Bob Ross YouTube videos. Like even if you don't paint like him, you can at least kind of follow his steps and you're like, it resembles this, even though it's not the same. Um, it makes painting like fun and easy, but painting's a great way because it just like totally, um, it kind of like works a different side of your brain. And then uh, if you're like too afraid to do that, there's always like paint by numbers or connect the dots or like adult coloring books. You can easily buy them on, on Amazon or um, YouTube and I'll use, or YouTube, Amazon or like Target. And uh, I really like that too. Like it can kind of, it's guided, but it's something that's like a mindless task. Like it's not something that you're like constantly thinking and don't let your mind wander. Like listen to an audiobook, listen to a podcast. I just found this really cool thing. If you have a library card, you can go on to, you can get an app called Overdrive and they have another app called Libby and you can actually put in your library card information into there and you can like download tons of audiobooks, tons of um, library books to read like on your iPad or your Kindle. It's really, really cool. So I've been doing that a lot just lately, like um, tons of audiobooks that I've, that I've gotten from the library. It's just, I don't know. I find that scrolling sometimes can like make me more stressed out over less stressed out. So that's kind of like, those are my kind of ways to find inner peace. Thoughts on ADHD. What can be done to help people, children who have it? Um, oftentimes it's, it's a, a mixture of issues and it always really depends on um, what the person is uh, struggling with. So I, I never find like every case is the same. A lot of times there's different driving factors. Um, sometimes it's liver, sometimes it's the, the person just not getting enough fuel, nutrients, carbohydrates specifically. You know, a lot of times people say like, Low, lower your carbohydrate intake. And I'm like, eh, probably not. It's better to like avoid dyes and processed food and lots of like polyunsaturated fats like stuff like that is great to avoid and to make sure like a nutrient dense nourishing diet oftentimes that really does help as well as gut health um really approaching it from a gut health perspective um some sometimes something as simple as like putting in a really good probiotic 
getting some inflammation down really really does help so again it just really depends on like what the person's history is where the person's coming from what their specific issues like is it attention is it um, maybe just like very like hyperactive and then also a lot of times children like this is going to be maybe co a controversial statement but like we expect a child who is developing and growing and needs to interact with the world in a specific way to develop to sit all day long for like eight to ten hours and to take a test and to read a book and to have like this very set schedule and that's just not how children fun like function often children like there might be a select few who do really well in that type of environment but often children who need to learn in a different way like they are hyperactive because they literally have to sit in a chair for like eight hours a day so of course like they're bouncing off the walls by the end of the day like they need some type of stimulation they need to interact in their world with a different way they need to get their hands on something you know they need to learn in a different way they need to feel things smell things taste things see things and so a lot of times we expect children to fit into a certain environment and then um, because they are like bouncing off the wall by the end of the day we we think that they are you know <laughs> are maybe hyperactive and sometimes it's not the case so um i think it's like always important to um examine like mental emotional environment and then also physical of course nutrition sleep those types of things but it can be a very holistic perspective and it's very different on, on a case-to-case -case basis thoughts on coronavirus what should we be doing to protect ourselves i have international travel plan next month i honestly like just Wash my hands, take some wipes, take some oregano, good. I'm not stressed about it at all. <laughs> um, three weeks taking K2 supplement you told me about as well as magnesium and still getting tonsil stones help. Um, you know, it's one of those things where it can take time. Um, you know, it can take time. Um, I, I am not really exactly sure like your exact case. Um, I mean, I, maybe I am, <laughs> maybe you are a client. Uh, sometimes I like don't, uh, I don't correlate the uh, Instagram handle name with the client name because I'm seeing your full name and not your Instagram handle. So correct me if I'm wrong. But um, uh, when it comes to calcification, sometimes people have like years and years of cal calcification. And so some people will have calcium off the charts and then it takes time to get calcium levels down sometimes months to get calcium levels down so that's a possibility um like i've said before i i don't know what drives tonsil stones some people that have high calcium do get tonsil stones but um and there is some calcification there but some people that don't have high calcium get tonsil stones as well and so um it's just kind of one of those things where um, it was an observation and kind of like a suggestion, but not, you know, not like, a, you know, a fix for it always. What about eating seasonally, but then the OJ and marmalade do you suggest still do it when it isn't in season? Um, citrus has two seasons, so oftentimes it is going to be pretty seasonal. Um, a lot of people don't realize that people would store up citrus for months and months after a citrus season for vitamin C and things like that. And jellied jams and things are going to be eaten out of season. So, you know, just because it's not seasonal doesn't mean it wasn't eaten out of season. Um, you do need carbohydrates. You do need fruits, especially when you're trying to heal. And so, yeah, oftentimes in the winter, you would opt for more tubers, more starches maybe. And some people do do okay with those. Some people do need the fruit. Some people do feel good on it. And honestly, like, I think we kind of get obsessed with like ancestral eating. And I'm like, in no way, shape, or form do you live like your ancestors did at all. You are not an an your ancestor. You live in a completely different world, a completely different environment, and so you need to act as such. And if you have something available to you that's going to help you heal or to help you feel better or rejuvenate quicker, why the heck are you not taking advantage of it in the name of eating like an ancestor or eating seasonally? Yeah, it's a good idea to not eat a strawberry that has sit in a, sat in a cold storage room for like five months. 
but it's it's okay to to eat something that was grown in an area of the world that it was grown seasonally and it was it is pretty fresh so i think orange juice is a great way to get some some access to fruit when you can't find in season fruit because often we, we it's very difficult to find fruit in the winter right like it's so hard to find uh ripe in season fruit and so sometimes the only thing that i can find that's ripe and in season and that actually doesn't taste disgusting is orange juice and so that's going to be my fruit source for the times when i can't get whole ripe fruit because i'm not going to eat like unripe fruit that's out of season what's your best tip for eliminating hormonal acne um to start usually eating a raw carrot every single day um and then if you're not having a regular bowel movement making sure that's happening and and doing what needs to what needs to happen to get a regular bowel movement um around 60 grams of fat more like if okay so if we're gonna do like 25 percent fat based on a 2000 calorie diet i believe that's gonna look like 45 to 55 grams um i, I don't have a calculator in front of me so don't quote me Temps and pulses and digestion have been amazing, but on random days I get itchy skin rashes and headache and brain fog, thinking histamine, don't want to limit foods, broth, etc. If it's random and you're not noticing correlation, it could possibly be detoxification. Um, if it continues to happen or it gets worse, then it could be something um, like histamine related. But sometimes people react to one thing like bone broth, but they're fine with gelatin or vice versa. So uh, you can always uh, experiment by like cutting out, you know, bone broth for a week and seeing if things improve or cutting out gelatin for a week, cutting out all of it for a week and seeing if it improves. You know, it's one of those things where oh, it's not going to hurt you to, to omit it for a week and see if it makes a difference. And if it does, great. You've kind of pinpointed what's the pro what the problem is. But if it's just kind of random um, and there's no correlation with anything, then it could just possibly be more like detoxification and shifts happening. If temps are low and I'm low energy, is just falling FN enough to bring it up? And what if I'm insatiable? I feel like I just want to eat all day, but I eat super healthy. What gives? Um, usually, if we're fatigued, our body's conserving energy. If our pulses are low, our body's conserving energy. And if you're insatiable, you're really hungry, it's possible that you need the energy. Um, usually, that subsides after like a week or two. Um unless you have like an active high stress. But I know that you said you're breastfeeding, I believe. So it's one of those things where if you're insatiable while you're breastfeeding, that's usually pretty common, um, or at least hungry, you know? Um, so um, it, it kind of depends. Um, is following FN enough to bring it up? It's possible. The only way that you know is just by following FN consistently for a while, giving it, you know, at least a couple of, um, usually like four to eight weeks, give it a couple of months. But um, sometimes it's not. Sometimes there's another maybe underlying imbalance going on that can be resolved with just nutrition. But um, oftentimes, at least it gets you moving in the right direction, gets you 40, 50% better so you can continue to kind of discover what, what's going on. But regardless of what's going on, if, if FN doesn't resolve it, FN is the foundation to start getting to the point where you can resolve it. Because for example, like I personally implement fully nourished with every single client before we even start to work on hormones or before we even start to work on minerals. Because if you're not just getting the, your basic needs like proper nutrition, sleep, um, exercise, um, red light, then you're probably not going to move in the right direction regardless of how many supplements you take, regardless of how many protocols you go on. Um, it's just not going to really make a difference. So uh, the only way to know if fully nourished is enough is just to do it consistently and give it, you know, four to eight weeks uh, of, of being very consistent. Sometimes I find that people are not very consistent and they say they're being consistent and they kind of need to get real with themselves and say, have I actually been consistent with what Jessica said to do? Um, if not, then it's kind of like, okay, I'm going to give it like four to eight weeks, going to really give it a shot of consistency. Um, but then if there's really like no changes or no improvements, you're not moving in the right direction, then absolutely there could be some other things that need to be discovered and resolved. Just took my temperature, 98.6, is this good? 
yeah, 98.6 is great, but what is it in relationship with your pulses? Um, if we have high temp and low pulse, then probably not a great idea, uh, or probably not as great as we're thinking it is. Um, if we have optimal pulses and temps, then that's great. We want our temps to be, to be between 75 and 85. Do you have specific goals and timing to track temps and pulses? Yeah, this is what I teach in Fully Nourished. So we want to take it upon waking. We want to see our, our temperature at least um, about 97.8. And we want to see our pulses above um, 75 and or like around at least 70 to 75 and then after breakfast we want to see that increase we do not want to see it de decrease if we see breakfast is decreasing our temperatures or decreasing our pulses we are actively seeing ourselves waking up with stress right high cortisol high adrenaline and then our breakfast is lowering that stress by providing our body with fuel and that's why our temps and pulses are lower after breakfast and so we need to first work on resolving that stress issue We've got to wake up with a lower temp and pulse than after breakfast. Um, we want to see throughout the day our temps and pulses are gradually rising to peak at around 1 to 2 p.m., sometimes 3 or 4 p.m. And we want that to be more clo or closer to 98.6, a little bit above, and between 75 and 85, more towards that maybe 85 mark if we can get it hotter. We want to see ourselves slowly getting warmer and getting a higher metabolism over the course of the day, 3 to 4 p.m. We want all of our habits, our exercise, our sunlight exposure, our, our nutrition, our fueling to all kind of culminate to get to this like peak point and then it will slowly decrease before bed and then we want to do that again the next day. We want to be waking up with optimal pulses and see them rise throughout the day but we always want to look at it in conjunction with pulse. Why? Because cortisol and adrenaline raises temperature. And so some people think like, oh, I'm good. Like I have a 98.6 temperature, I'm great. And then we check pulse and it's like 55. And it's like, oh, metabolism is being suppressed by cortisol and adrenaline. So we wanna look at temps and pulse because sometimes temperatures lie. Stress can drive heat, which is why it is, you know, you can lose weight when you're under stress, right? Like you, a lot of people will lose, um, lose weight, they'll get skinnier, or um, a lot of people that are doing excessive amounts of exercise, you'll see them lose a lot of weight fast. It does burn calories, but it also, eat, you know, you're eating your tissues too. My luteal phase has lengthened from 14 to 15 to 16 days, but I still get sore breasts after ovulation. I have hashies. Is iodine useful for breast tenderness? Um, it's possible some women have um, claimed that iodine helps with their uh, breast tenderness. Um, I, I'm careful with iodine. I usually recommend go getting a test from your doctor or getting some type of test that's going to test for iodine before you just like supplement it willy-nilly. Um, but there are a lot of women who have and, and say that it has really helped with their, their breast sensitivity. It does help um, our breast tissue and our ovarian tissue or our ovary tissue um, does have a high need for the mineral iodine. So yeah, sometimes people can um, see a, a improvement with supplementing iodine. Are you familiar with Dr. Nick Gonzalez's work and his metabolic types? If so, any thoughts? His metabolic types. Uh, yes, uh, metabolic typing was kind of taught in my school. Um, I'm not like really a big fan. I just find that it doesn't really like work very well. Like for me, like I'm personally, I've always been told like I need to stay away from meats and stay away from fats and it's like the, and, and be like more of a vegetarian and I do not do well on that type of diet. I do do well on a lower fat diet and higher carbohydrate diet. Like, yeah, for sure. Um, but I think that your metabolic type can change, right? Like we are shifting. A lot of people are now these slow oxidizers or slow, um, they have very slow metabolisms. And I think that it's uh, kind of an environmental and a habit-based thing and not really like, oh, this is just how you are. Uh, personally, I think that that's kind of like a cop-out. Like, oh, I'm just this way. Like, I'm just like, you know, I just, I'm like a slow oxidizer. Like, this is what I, you know, this is what I need to eat. Like, I'm not going to eat for the metabolism I have. I'm going to eat for the metabolism I want. And uh, the metabolism does shift based on, on what it has access to. 
Okay, so uh, Instagram's gonna cut me off in like two minutes. Uh, I'm gonna end it and I'm gonna restart it when I, when I get cut off. So if I don't get to your question, just join me again and ask me again. Can you please talk about the benefits of Camu Camu Vitamin C? Um, yeah, I mean, vitamin C, I have a whole highlight story labeled vitamin C, and it talks about whole foods vitamin C and how important it is. Vitamin C helps with um, copper utilization as well as iron utilization. It's very supportive to the liver. It's very supportive to the adrenal glands, but this is true only for whole foods vitamin C. Many people are like, oh, I take vitamin C, but they're taking ascorbic acid, which is tends to actually be really inflammatory and do the opposite of whole foods vitamin C. So the camu camu berry or the acerola cherry is very, rich in whole foods vitamin C which is why you know getting you know taking camu camu can be so beneficial opinion on CBD for sleep and anxiety um, usually magnesium deficiency like if we need CBD we have problems um, but it can be kind of a, like a nice stepping stone or a band-aid while we're working to resolve our issues but I do think it's kind of like um, just a band-aid um, I don't think it, it necessarily like needs to be taken long term of course if it helps with the situation why not utilize it but also get to the root of why um for example sleep and anxiety is bad um thoughts on copper id is there any chance that it could cause biochemical problems in the body yeah it's always possible um the, you know a lot of people have reported getting copper toxicity or copper issues um being on the copper iud long term this is not always the case some people are fine it just i think it really depends on like what copper levels are in the body before going on the copper iud and then copper does interact with other minerals like like zinc but it really is a as a case-by-case -case basis all right guys i'll see you in a second